Okay, thanks everyone. And now uh, let me turn uh, to our guests. Uh, uh, we have with us today the Executive Director of the UN Population Fund, Natalia Kanem, and Isha Sise. Uh, Ms. Kanem, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Natalie Kanem, are you there? Hello, uh, are are UNFPA guests on the line? But uh, waiting to hear from Natalia Kanem or Isha Sise. I'm here. Hello, Rohan. Aisha's oh, here. Hello. Be... Oh, okay. Okay. Great. So sorry. So sorry. Can I be heard now? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay. So sorry. Greetings to all. I am very proud to announce that UNFPA, the UN Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, is joining forces with Ms. Isha Sese, whom we're appointing today as UNFPA's newest Goodwill Ambassador. Ms. Sise is an award-winning journalist. She worked for over a decade at CNN, where she memorably covered the story of the abduction of Chibok girls in Northern Nigeria in 2014. She's the co-founder of Women Everywhere Can Lead, an NGO in her native country of Sierra Leone. It works to empower, educate, and support adolescent girls in achieving their full potential. Ms. Sise has dedicated her life and career to upholding the rights of women and girls and to lending her voice to issues at the heart of the UNFPA mandate. She is the partner that UNFPA needs as we take the road to 2030. And as we fight to end maternal deaths, to end unmet need for family planning, and of course, to end gender-based violence and harmful practices. UNFPA could not have anybody more determined and passionate at our side to uphold women and girls' rights, especially their right to live free of violence and abuse. In recent weeks, Lucise embarked on a virtual world tour of UNFPA offices around the world. She has been meeting UNFPA staff on the ground, NGO partners and clients, all to learn more about UNFPA activities and the devastating impact that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on women and girls. It is UNFPA's honor to welcome her as the newest member of our worldwide wide team, especially today as we launch the 16 Days Against Violence. Isha, we look forward to working with you and together we will not stop until the rights, choices, and the bodies of women and girls everywhere are fully their own. Thank you very much. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, first, let me say a, a huge thank you to Dr. Cannon for those very kind words and for um, the, this appointment. And also, also the thanks go to the Secretary General, also um, to Guterres for appointing me. I just want to say a, a huge thank you. It is such an honor to be joining the UNFPA team. As uh, Dr. Cannon mentioned, uh, I'm originally from Sierra Leone, a country that has long faced its own challenges with uh, gender inequity and harmful practices, um, amongst many other issues. And for me, as a black African woman, to be joining this team and to be able to commit my voice to the efforts of UNFPA, it's it's deeply humbling and it's 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 a huge honor. So I want to say thank you for that. Um, I just also want to share that you know my commitment to um, sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, is deep and it's long running. Um, Dr. Cannon mentioned my work around the Chibok girls, which is one of many stories I covered as a CNN anchor and correspondent um, committed to telling stories of 
injustice and particularly how they affect women in the unique context that they, and ways that they impact women and girls. So for me, Chibok was very much a life-changing event. And um, I'm proud of the work that we did in telling the story of nearly 300 schoolgirls being abducted and really being denied the right to fulfill their potential. And thankfully, 107 of them are back, but there still are 112 of them who remain um, unaccounted for. So that remains unfinished business. Um, there's also a personal dimension to my connection to the work that UNFPA does. As I said, I'm from Sierra Leone. I'm also from a family in which my grandfather, one of his wives, was someone who performed um, FGM. She was what we call a cutter. Um, and so I come from a family where this practice is known. Um, my mother herself is a survivor. Um, and I come from a country where up to 90% of women um, are subjected to FGM. So this is an issue that I'm very much um, going to be taking on as a goodwill ambassador with the UNFPA team. I just really want to say that as we mark today, the beginning of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, we have to come together. And as UNFPA, we are already saying enough, enough to all forms of violence against women and girls. And I'll be using you know, my voice, my privilege, and my position in the months and in the years ahead to ensure that that message is heard loud and clear. So again, thank you to Dr. Cannon and to the UN for this appointment. Thank you very much, Mrs. Se. And um, I'll now open the floor for questions. Uh, James, uh, you have hands raised. Uh, you get the floor. James Bayes, Al Jazeera. Um, Executive Director, good to see you again. A question to you both, um, and it's about the incoming administration in the United States. Clearly, over the last four years, we've say, seen the U.S. at the U.N., take positions on gender and reproductive issues that are different from its traditional positions. We've seen, certainly talking to diplomats, um, the hand of the vice president's office directly, uh, Vice President Pence's office. Um, what outreach have you made to the Biden administration or will you be making to the Biden administration now? Well, thank you for the question, James. Happy to start. UNFPA uh, is well aware that the United States, as a force in terms of leadership on women's rights, uh, as well as actually a founder of UNFPA, has immense power in terms of the types of women and girls that Isha just referred to, meaning every woman and girl around the world is subjected to gender bias some more tragically and drastically, but in every sense. Therefore, uh, given this historical leadership politically, as well as financially, to UNFPA, um, we do uh, our utmost to make sure that the partnership with the uh, U.S. government yes. succeeds. They are still a leading donor when it comes to contraception. And as you know, UNFPA aims to end unmet need for contraception is a very important way of, of empowering women. Looking forward uh, to the uh, upcoming administration, as you've referred to the uh, uh, president and vice president elect, we are uh, uh, advised that it, the, the, up the, the vice president elect in particular, um, um, Kamala Harris, has been a strong proponent on maternal health and so we do hope to see points of intersection with the uh, administration upcoming. But simply put, um, we do hope that the United States will continue to lead when it comes to the rights and choices of women and girls who, after COVID now, really depend on the United World to change their fate. Thank you. For my part, James, I, I will just echo everything the executive director said. You know, um, as part of the UNFPA team, we look forward to working with um, the Biden-Harris administration and hope to achieve a great deal together. Thanks. Um, I'd now turn the floor over to Evelyn Leopold. Evelyn. Hi. Good to see you, Dr. Cannon. Um, I uh, have... James took my 
asked, I was asked at the briefing yesterday too, um, have what kind of uh, uh, damage has the UN position, whether it's on the gag rule or on reproductive rights, done to UNFPA so far? Do you expect it to rejoin UNFPA? And uh, uh, has, has there been, what have been the downsides so far? Well, thank you so much, Evelyn. Good to see you. Um, let me remark that the uh, so-called global gag rule, which applies to uh, non-governmental organizations, does not directly affect the work of multilaterals in the United Nations. But of course, our partners with whom we work so closely, and in fact, um, in UNFPA's case, we depend on local partners to be able to have our midwives be able to get out there to remote areas in humanitarian settings, those social workers, et cetera. We do a lot of our work in concert with uh, civil, civil society on the ground. Therefore, I will say that um, while the global gag rule uh, affects that sector, it affects sexual and reproductive health and rights. Moreover, um, as you know, Kem Kasten, which did directly uh, affect UNFPA and led to the loss of about $69 million of U.S. funding. Right now, um, I too am worried about the situation in Ethiopia. And as women refugees are crossing into Sudan, my team there has been doing their utmost to attend to 33,000 newly arrived uh, refugees of whom 700 we estimate be pregnant. I've already heard a tragic story of a woman who has lost her baby in the walk across that border. And uh, out of that uh, number, uh, a good percentage are expected to be women of reproductive age. Hence, there are certain things, as you well know, the dignity kits that we provide for menstrual supplies. This is simple women's biology. Our ability to protect women from violence when they are vulnerable. So ultimately, uh, there is an effect, of course, in the loss of uh, U.S. monetary support for such activities that UNFPA would have undertaken. And as you know, um, as part of the U.N. and believing in dialogue, as we do, we have tried to maintain uh, uh, an open door as much as possible to keep discussions going, especially for the humanitarian situation, which weighs on us so heavily in UNFPA. Thank you. And uh, the next question goes uh, uh, to Fumita Pesato. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Fumita Pesato from NHK. Thank you very much for uh, this briefing. Uh, I have a question about FGM. Uh, you laid out the uh, one of the terrible uh, practice uh, in the world. Uh, my colleague is now uh, making a news coverage in Sudan regarding this issue. So my question uh, is, uh, what is what is your view on uh, the current status of FGM, and what can you do more for uh, stop uh, this FGM? Thank you. Allow me to defer to Isha um, if she would like to start. As, um, as, as, as Isha is not coming in immediately, allow me to say that um, harmful practices such as female genital mutilation and child marriage are much more widespread than one would realize. So the practice of FGM, which has no basis in religion, um, it often uh, is given the excuse of culture, is something that our new goodwill ambassador has really paid a lot of attention to. And let me defer to her to um, speak to this issue and why UNFPA is so determined by the year 2030 to have eradicated the pro the, 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 uh, th that practice. Over to you, please. 
Thank you, Dr. Cannon. We had some mute on mute issues there. Um, uh, from Tucker, thank you so much for the question. Um, as you know, there are 200 million uh, women are alive today who have undergone um, FGM. And when we look at the numbers ahead for you know, looking, projecting to the next decade, 2030, 68 million. Uh, more women and girls are at risk. And so it's very pressing and very urgent for us. Um, we talk about what we can do more to, to, to really eliminate this. Again, UNFPA believes in engagement and education. And being an African woman who comes from an environment where FGM is prevalent, we will be leaning and I will be leaning into those, those understandings and the fact that I do come from that environment, and so the way we engage will be will, will resonate differently. We hope, and, and we will be able to speak directly with the knowledge that you cannot simply um, exclude or dismiss as being an outsider coming in to tell you how to to, to carry on as a society, as a community. So we, we hope that engagement with this new kind of um, positioning will reap some rewards, particularly in the African context um, and in places like Sierra Leone and South Sudan, and really will continue on the efforts that UNFPA have been on, which is to engage and to educate and to, again, to, to show how this is very harmful psychologically as, long, as well as physically um, to, to women and girls around the world. So it's engagement, but engagement with maybe different tenor and tone. Thank you. And Farhan, if I could just quickly add that, um, UNFPA works very closely with UNICEF on the issue of FGM. This is an example of collaboration within the UN in order to work with communities and empower girls in particular to speak out. So we would be happy to um, provide you with uh, lots of information. There's very, very good data on this issue. And I think Isha speaks with confidence knowing that culture does change. And this is a cultural practice that can damage the womb. It can damage uh, the girl's ability to, um, as a matter of fact, sometimes it can even lead to death if, if, if she bleeds to death. So it is a very important problem that we intend to work on together with our Goodwill Ambassador. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much for, for mentioning all that. Um, uh, Richard Roth has a question. Richard, over to you. Yes, I realize this is a very serious <laughs> subject, but I want to uh, most uh, say mo many of these goodwill ambassadors, once they attain that post, they they kind of they shun uh, some of the people they met in the past. I mean, Clooney, Jolie, they never call back. Uh, Ms. Say, I hope will remember those who uh, she came in contact with before joining these uh, UN ranks. Uh, and it's good to see. I said it to someone at CNN in 2003 that that woman will go far. I think I told someone. Um, <laughs> maybe it was uh, her. But anyway, uh, nice to see you. Uh, perhaps you could tell us which governments and countries are allowing uh, these horrors the most to continue. And now that you're on the other side, where in the media you couldn't speak, or at least in the early years, or speak uh, boldly and uh, name people. Will you name and shame some of these countries that, as you engage with people uh, that you feel are not uh, doing their best to help end this horrible practice? Well, uh, uh, thank you, my friend, Richard Ross. Um, it is very good to see you, and I promise I will always call back and uh, look forward to the end of this pandemic when you can buy me another coffee. Um, Richard and I are long-term colleagues and friends and covered the UN General Assembly together for many years while I was at CNN. So, um, so he will understand that I will dodge his question somewhat and just say that... Um, when it comes to, to something like FGM, um, most countries have banned it, but there are a handful where it is still prevalent and is still taking place. Sierra Leone, which is my home country, did officially ban it last year, but the question is enforcement and what we're seeing now, this medicalization of FGM that is taking place in hospitals. So it remains a pressing challenge. Um, you know, we, you, you ask, but will I name and shame countries? I think I will continue my tradition of speaking truthfully and respectfully um, to um, those who are um, abusing and minimizing, ignoring the rights of women and girls around the world. So um, 
uh, let's just say, Richard, I shall continue being myself, even within the hallowed halls of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, orange, by the way. Yeah. It, it, it's a good choice of color for today. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, Evelyn has a follow-up. Uh, so, Evelyn, uh, back to you. Yes, thank you, <clears throat> Farhan. Uh, to Dr. Cannon and Ms. Sese, uh, on FGM, do you have a list of uh, which countries it's most prevalent in? And I, while it's difficult to generalize, is the trend positive, negative, or one doesn't know of the frequency of FGM? Thank you. Well, happy to, to start. Uh, Part of the purpose of the uh, UNFPA and UNICEF Alliance against FGM is to collect data. To leave no one behind, you need to know where they are, you need to know who they are. And of course, uh, female genital mutilation is a very sensitive issue. It, you have to say the word sex and genital and so many other things out loud, which uh, is not considered polite society. We also um, understand that for this practice to change, it's not shame that's going to change the practice, it's understanding. And uh, we have reached out, for example, to uh, men's groups because fathers and uh, uh, husbands are very influential in terms of this practice. The reason very often for FGM is to uh, assure marriageability of a girl, shall we say. So for men in particular to understand the risks of FGM, the fact that it is not uh, something that is blessed by the Quran, etc., is very, very important. Now, on data, because of the sensitivity, while we don't have perfect data, we have been able to track, and the trend is going down. There are two things, and I'm speaking now as a pediatrician, myself as a doctor, but also with someone who, you know, the population fund, we track data. The number of people in the world has increased, therefore the number of girls in the world is increasing. And usually in de developing countries, the rate of population increase is greater. So while the pace of the practice may be decreasing, and it is, it's going so slowly. This is why we need people with Isha's voice and presence um, not just for FGM, but for child marriage and so many other things where her perspective is important. The, the trend is down, but because of the sheer numbers of girls, we really are not seeing the impact. By the year 2030, we said zero harmful practices, and we need everyone to understand that this is something that can be overcome with focus, with attention, and that's what we want to bring to it. Thank you. Isha, please feel free to add. Thank you, Dr. Canham. And I just want to add that, um, as you heard Dr. Canham say, the trend is going down, but also with the disruption caused by this pandemic and the interruption to UNFPA um, prevention programming, you know, the concern now is that we could be looking at something like 2 million, that, that's the data that UNFPA has been able to crunch, 2 million additional FGM cases could occur over the next decade because of interruption to, to our, our programming. So, yes, the trend had been going down, but now there's this new urgency and this new concern um, that due to COVID, that the work uh, that we have been doing uh, it will have to be redoubled and, you know, we will really have to lean into this. So huge concerns. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I don't see any further questions. Uh, uh, if anyone wants to raise their hands, uh, and uh, this is essentially a last call. Other than that, I would like to thank our guest. Uh, thank, thank you very much for, 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 your, work, for your words here. And, uh, and I wish everyone a good afternoon and um, hopefully a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So, take care. Right. Take care. Bye.